Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yuri Wellington. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, so the name of this presentation is Widening the Circle, Reconceptualizing Teacher Education as Professional Development Schools in Rural Cambodia. And I, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why I chose that name. Uh, as our moderator has mentioned to you, this conference is about out-of-school children, but teacher training is something that tends to happen in a school. And actually, it was that very issue that led to the development of our program. So I want to tell you a little story. I was invited to go to Cambodia in 2008 to conduct some teacher trainings around balanced literacy, because literacy is one of my specialties. And I said, sure, I can do that. So I went. <laughs> and I arrived. And the day for the training came. And here was the interesting thing about the people that were before me. First, they were all adults working with children, but none of them actually had any training as a teacher. So one of their hopes was that I would, in this weekend workshop, teach them how to be a teacher. And so I said, OK, you can't do that in a weekend, but let's talk. The second thing was that they had all been hired to teach English. And none of them actually spoke English. So I said, well, I definitely can't teach you how to speak English in a weekend, but let's talk. And from there, a conversation developed. And I should say that this was in the Siem Reap area, which is one of the larger populated areas in Cambodia because of Angkor Wat and the tourism. And yet, it's very provincial. And at the time, in 2008, the majority of the folks that we were seeing who were local community members were still living without consistent electricity, without running water. Um, and a large percentage of children were out of school. Many of the adul adults had not finished a formal education through the end of secondary school. So, but everybody was very, very concerned about providing schooling, quality schooling, for the children of Cambodia. If you asked anybody on the street, and I did have conversations with many people, they all said, yes, this is very important. So we started to explore what the different ways were that we could provide teacher, a teacher training program. Our first idea was to partner with other NGOs who were already doing non-formal education. And that was a great idea, but the issue was that everybody had a different idea about what they wanted their teachers to know how to do. And in most non-formal settings, were not run by trained teachers themselves. They were run by, as someone said in an earlier session, passionate people who came to the country and stayed because they wanted to make a difference. Um, so that, that became a little difficult. The second thing that we tried was to secure a location and run it like a regular school and even have housing so that people from outlying areas who were the, um, those were the communities that we were most interested in serving because those were the communities that did not have trained teachers, they could come and they could stay. Well. The thing was, um, many of those folks who were interested in teaching also had families. And the idea of going and living in a boarding situation was not something that was actually very realistic. So we came up with the idea of going to the community and taking the training to the community. So Teach Cambodia, our number one priority is providing world-class teacher training. And I'll talk about why we call it world-class teacher training. And to advance knowledge of an understanding of the schooling system in Cambodia. There's a lot of misconception back in 2008 about what was actually happening in Cambodia with education. And I, I doubt that many people who had opinions had actually taken the time to read 
the strategic plan, which was actually a very well thought out document. Um, now, implementing that strategic plan had its own issues, and that's kind of another thing that we, um, one of the reasons why we developed a partnership um, with the Ministry of Education. Our third goal is to promote, um, Oh, I'm not doing this very well, am I? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is to promote uh, development, implementation, and maintenance of innovative, academically challenging, and culturally appropriate curriculum. Now, Ashley touched on this a little bit. At the time, most um, Cambodian education, especially in the primary schools, was rote. The teacher states the answer the student is called upon and the student repeats the answer. And if the answer is incorrect, then the teacher restates the answer, the student is called upon, and, and the student gives the answer. The problem with that is that, uh, first of all, I, a lot of the teachers tended to call first on the students who they knew would give the correct answer. And I actually asked this of teachers, why do you call on the students that know the answer? And they said, well, that way the students that don't know the answer can hear it from the students who know the answer. The problem with that is if you have 60 students and you're calling on each one, you have a tendency to run out of time. So the students who needed the most help got the least attention from the teachers and often never spoke in class because their turn never came. So the idea of bringing other methods of teaching to the primary classroom was something that was very important to us. And the, third wa uh, the fourth goal was to promote self-sustainable communities of learning. One of the things that I noticed back in 2008 was that lots of, um, lots of NGOs were popping up providing non-formal education for out-of-school children. Lots of folks were coming in and building schools. But if you uh, looked at a school in January of 2008, when it was first built, and then you went back six months later, often it was empty. There were no more materials because the original donation had been consumed. And whoever had provided that original donation wasn't interested in being a part of that program long term. They just, they wanted to build a school in Cambodia and that was not sustainable. It also um, established an expectation from rural communities and impoverished communities that they needed to sit and wait for somebody to come and do this for them. That they didn't have the control over what was gonna happen in their own community and we just didn't feel that was um, sustainable. So, um, I, this is out of order. Hold on. Okay, so the, the, I think I accidentally deleted a slide. So, we developed a program that offers a certificated teacher training program. I'm going to skip this slide because it's... Let me ask you a question. Okay. Now, even though this session is about teacher training, the reason we need teachers is because we have students who need to go to school, right? So when we went to Sambur, which was our first location, we were invited there to train teachers. But in order to do that, we needed to understand the context. And so I sat and I observed for a month, I went to school every day. I videotaped every teacher in his or her classroom, and I just watched the entire day unfold from beginning to end. And I have a question for you, and I'd like everybody to kind of look at these choices up here. And my question is, why do children stay out of school? A, because they have no money for books or uniforms. That's kind of true, right? How many of you would say that's true? B, because of poverty, they have to work to help support the family. Okay. 
Uh, C, because they failed, in, in the Cambodian system, there's an exam at the end of every term, and if you fail for two terms, then you fail out of that grade, and there's no opportunity without repeating the grade to continue in school. So they either fail or they stay home because they're afraid of failing. Anybody? Okay. What about D, not interested in learning? I can honestly say that in 40 years in education, I've never met a kid that didn't want to learn. I've met a lot of students who had been um, indoctrinated, come to believe that it wasn't possible for them to learn. But I never met a kid who didn't want to learn. How about E, no school in the area or it's hard to get to school? Okay, Ashley talked a little bit about that. And what about F, no teachers or the lack of certified teachers? Okay, so let me paint a picture for you. It is Tuesday morning at Sumbor School. There are 850 students enrolled, about between 60 and 75 students per class. And on this day, the first, second, and third grade building, which has five classes in the morning session, has two teachers present. Two teachers are running back and forth between three classrooms trying to teach a total of almost 300 students, okay? Just keep that picture in mind. And let's go to the next question. Um, these are the teachers that teach at Sambur. Could I have that? And I think this is important to note because it sort of answers why weren't those teachers there. This is... Chun Cham Nan, she went to school through the ninth grade, and then she had her first child. She brings her three children to work with her, so she teaches carrying that baby, and the other two children are also in the room. These two girls here are in the 11th grade. They go to school in 11th grade in the morning, and they teach first grade and second grade in the afternoon. This is Mia Koi, who is actually Chun Cham Nan's grandfather, he only went to school through the third grade and then, you know, the Khmer Rouge kind of interrupted his education. But he is one of the three founders of Sambur School. Okay, and he teaches in the third grade. Next slide, please. So, I just described four of our teachers, and I'm willing to bet that none of them fit the profile of what you would think a traditional teacher is. So, what is the greatest obstacle facing teacher training in rural Cambodia? Is it lack of a living wage? Non-trained teachers in 2008 were making between 25 and 50 US dollars a month to work six days a week, okay? Lack of resources for the classroom and district support. Uh, there was no paper, there were no pens, there were no whiteboards, there were no whiteboard markers. Basically, there was nothing. No training program nearby. Now, there is a provincial training center in Siem Reap. But two things. One, you have to have a secondary school diploma in order to attend. And two, you have to be able to afford the tuition. Oh, and the third thing, it's, even though it's only six kilometers, if you are a poor person who doesn't have transportation and who has a family, that six kilometers is an impossibility. How about D, cannot afford to go to school? Yeah, that's a big problem. E, not eligible to go to school. Uh, as I said, you needed a secondary school diploma in order to qualify to go to provincial training school. So all of, so Mia Koi, who only went to school through the third grade, the two girls who were only in 11th grade, Chun Cham Nan, who only went to school through the ninth grade, none of them were eligible to go to teacher training school. And four, I mean, F, other priorities to sustain life. One of the other teachers at the school, we had a very high absentee rate among teachers as well as children when we began. And I asked him why he was absent so much. His family also owned a rice farm. 
And he said, school is important, but eating is more important. So if I don't have food to put on the table, then it doesn't matter whether there's school or not. And although I agree with him on that, the thing about it was that somebody had to be in school in order for children to be able to come and be taught. Next slide. So that's why we call this session Widening the Circle. And it comes from a poem. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a larger circle that took him in. And basically, um, what we did was we looked at the context. The out-of-school children, the lack of trained teachers, the lack of resources, and nobody wanting to go past the end of the road to provide any of these things. And we said, how are we going to do that? We took the training to the school. We developed um, an agreement with the Ministry of Education where if we trained this staff and they were able to pass all of the courses, um, then they would receive the ministry's teacher certificate at the end and become a licensed teacher. So that would provide income for their families. We use the professional development model because these people are already teaching in school. And where we started, next slide, is that the first thing is we had to create a sense of place, okay? In the upper left-hand corner here, this is a classroom when we first started. Now, if you're a teacher that's making only $25 a month to come six days a week, is this a place that's going to inspire you to show up every day? Almost anything that someone comes up with for you to do is going to be more important. So we use sweat equity. This is actually the assistant director and the teachers. They, we provided the supplies and the materials, and they renovated the school. After that, it was a much different thing. Everybody started coming to school every day. They started remarking if someone was defacing a wall or something like that. Next. Okay. The next thing that we did was we had to establish a sense of community and a sense of where people came from. We started with an exercise where I asked the question to all of the teachers, where are you from? And they put a pin on the map. And then I said, where do you live? And they put a pin on the map. And it turns out that some of the teachers, their home was so far away that it wasn't even on this map but they often had temporary housing close to school. But that took them away from their families, and family is very important. But we needed people to understand that this was the context for the teachers in order to understand what kind of a teacher training program we needed. The next thing we did was we went and we looked at other schools. We visited formal and non-formal settings. And um, after that, we asked, what kind of things do you want to see at Sambor School? And before we did the site visits, they would say things like, I'd like to have a protractor for math, or I'd like a globe in my classroom. And I kept saying, think bigger. But they didn't think bigger <laughs> until after we um, went. Then we put up all of the ideas that everybody had, and we listed priorities. And then the, the teachers developed committees to work on those particular goals. This became the school improvement plan, which is the sustainable village schools portion, was critical to tying the teachers to that school, that they had an identity. I am a person who works for and with this school. In some ways, the coursework was the least important thing. Yeah, I know. Okay. So 
as we continued, and they, they went through a standard uh, teacher training coursework taught by professors from various universities around the United States, and I probably won't have time to talk about that. But you will notice over here, oops, that the SIP, returning to the SIP goals was an integral part of the program. So as we learned new methodologies for our classroom, we always said, how does that fit in with our overall goals? Okay, I'm quickly gonna go through this. Okay, now let's go back to the teachers, uh, to the students who were out of school. There was a very, very high dropout rate. On any given day, half the students were not in school, and by the end of the year, over half of the students weren't coming back at all. Okay, so one of the things that we did, and I'm going to just quickly flip through these, um, we did, what we instituted a, a visual ethnography program. We started by asking the students what goes on in their village on a regular day. And then we had them talk about it, draw pictures of it, and then paint the scenes on the school walls. What that did was it connected their home life to school. It gave them a reason to come to school because school was now part of their community. It also gave their parents a reason to come in to the, um, to the school. Because every one of these pictures represents an actual family's life within the community. Um, Ashley already talked about collaborative work, and so I'm not going to repeat because everything she said, um, we also do. But teaching our teachers to be reflective and also um, to work as teams. And modeling. So when we first arrived there, there was, I asked where the library was, and they, they took me to a room. It was under lock and key. They unlocked it and showed me the books, and I said, well, when did the children come in? And they said, oh, never, because if they came in, they would use the books, and then the books would get used up. So I said, well, what's the point of having books if they're not going to look at them? So we started by having them read in the library. Every class had to go to the library at least once a week, and within six months, student teachers were using books in their own classroom. And students were electing to read when they had recess time or something like that. Okay. I talked about um, partnerships. The way that th our program works is that we develop partnerships with universities around the United States and in other countries. And we contract with professors to come and teach one course, just one course. Because if they just teach one course, their institution will cover the costs most of the times. And so these are two professors from Chapman University. They teach two units of seminar, and the third unit is classroom practicum. It's where the teacher goes into the classroom, uses the Japanese model of lesson study, and teaches what they have learned. And that is facilitated and evaluated by our Kamai, um, our Kamai uh, partners. Am I almost done? So, th so there's just one more slide. Um, The key to teach Cambodia's success has been that the program that we developed, even though it came from outside of Cambodia, it is very much directed by the community that we are in. Every six months, we have a meeting, and we ask them, do you still want us here? Are we doing what you needed us to do? Are we doing what you wanted us to do? And they can say no at any time. In the beginning, for the first year, it was yes, 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 everything's wonderful. It took about a year, but then people started to say, actually, we'd rather this happened. Actually, we need that. And because of that, 
Even though I actually left Cambodia a year ago, the program continues on because the ownership is in the community. And I think that that is the most important, um, the most important detail. So thank you so much. I know I ran a little bit over, but. <laughs>